John is an exciting book. I love the book of John. It's a book about love. It's a book about the Lordship of Jesus, about His great love towards mankind. And we have landed upon John chapter 3 this week as we go through the book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we get into the Word of God. Yes, sir. There you go, sweetheart. <laughs> Today, we've got to look at John chapter 3, verse 1 and 21. In that, we're going to see the famous John 3.16. A verse we should all have memorized and known. A verse that the world knows because there's crazy dudes at football games that hold this big sign up. Right as they're about to kick the field goal. John 3.16, it's all over the place. It's been kind of used and abused a bit. But nonetheless, the power in this section of Scripture right here is unbelievable and unstoppable. I'm going to read this and we're going to go back through and look at it. I'm going to talk about the love and the mercy of God and the simplicity of our salvation in Christ. So turn with me to John chapter 3. You should have your Bible every week. You should have your pen, your highlighter. You should be taking notes. You should be beating your Bible up. We're due for a Bible check. Amen? That's when the pastor stands at the front door and I ask for your Bibles. If you, if I take your Bible and I open it and it goes <laughs> and the pages are pearly white, you're in trouble. Amen? The Bible should be you. It should be hanging. You should have tape in there. It should be marked up. It should be beaten up. It should be weathered. Unless you just got a new one because your old one wore out. Amen? Yeah. I won't go to a mechanic whose shop is crystal clean and I see no grease, especially on his fingers. You know why? He's not a mechanic. Amen? <laughs> mechanic, he's got a scruffy beard. He's got little black marks over here. He's got fingernails, he's biting them down, there's grease inside of them. There's little dirt marks, he's got this ugly jumpsuit, there's grease all over the place. His tools look black and dirty because he uses them. As a Christian, we have our sword, our Bible, our word, our source, our resource into God who he is and what he does. And in there we find life. We find Jesus because He is the Word and we need to use it. We need to use it. Daily. We need to be in God's Word. Amen? Amen. Moving on. John chapter 3 says this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you, you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who was in heaven. And as Moses uh, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten.
begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in the Son is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds might be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your word. For in it we find truth and we find life, Father. You are the word. Father, we ask this day, Father, that you help us to rightly divide your word, Lord. That you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you. Father, I would pray be the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, that you use me today as a tool. Lord, not my words going forward, Father but your words flowing through me. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. This is one of the rock bed foundational scriptures of our Christian faith right here, this whole section. In it, the simplicity of salvation through Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is laid out very clearly. It's so simply laid out that at times people cannot grasp hold of it because it appears just too simple. I think at times we have a problem with simplicity, especially the simplicity of a relationship with God because since we're created very self-centered, and if you don't believe that, just watch two little babies in a crib, put one toy in there, and watch what happens. No, mine. Back. Mine. If that's not evidence enough, I'll give you a scenario. We go to a party. And at the party, everybody's there, and somebody's taking pictures. And afterwards, we have this big event, big party. They come up to you and say, I got pictures from the party. Here, take a look. You start right from through them. Who's the first person you look for? Yourself. Oh, this one, get rid of that one. Oh, this one's pretty good. Oh, no, no. Oh, hey, yeah, there I am. Sorry, we're sinful by nature. It's just the truth. So at times, in that sinful nature that we have, we feel that I need to somehow earn this place into the kingdom of God. I need to do some work. I need to, I need to do something to be right with God. Really, that's not true because God did everything to right that position. It's a matter of faith and belief that makes the difference here. And it's such a simplistic faith that we have. Men, in the name of God, in the guise of truth, create religions and they pad and tack on things to a faith that were never there. In, in, in maybe trying to sincerely help and do things. You know, you got to do this. Well, you got to go to this club. You got to go to this school. You have to perform this. You need to say this prayer. Boom, boom, boom. It's not there. That's why I love the story of the thief on the cross. He didn't do any of that. Yet Jesus said he'd be with him. For as many people as don't get it, because it seems too simple. There are millions and billions of people who have gotten it, and they found the truth, and the truth has set them free, and they've been blessed eternally by the Scripture. And I have to point something out as well, is that if God doesn't reveal this to you, you're never going to get it. If God doesn't reveal this Lordship, this gift to you, you're not going to get it. It will be foolishness to you. We're told in 1 Corinthians 1.18 this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, 
It is the power of God. Now it may have been foolishness to you at one point, it may then have become the power of God and the salvation at another point. But there is a point of change, and that comes by God. He draws you to this place. Only God can reveal this to you. Only God can reveal to you that Jesus Christ is truly Lord and Savior of your life, that He died on the cross for your sins. It's a divine revelation. Jesus said this in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, what does it mean? How does God draw us? Does that mean only certain people get drawn and other people don't? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe in election God chooses some. I believe God knows everything. I believe God knows who's going to say what when they, when they do it. But it's freely received by anybody who would want to receive it. How do you get drawn by God? By having a heart to really know, a desire to really know God and His Son, Jesus. He is looking for people who are truly seeking Him. And this is what you got to understand with God. He created us to have a relationship with Him. It's His desire that we are with Him. He created man in the garden and He walked in the garden with man. But then there was sin. And a holy, righteous God was now with sinful people. And the, that relationship was broken. Jesus is the healing of that relationship. But you were not created to go to hell. Amen? God didn't make hell for you. Amen? He made it for the angels who fell and for their judgment. You were not created to go there. You were created to live eternally with Him. And His desire is that you are with Him. That you have a relationship with Him. It says this in 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. God's always looking for a man or a woman whose heart is to really know Him. He'll never turn you away. God will never turn away a heart that is for Him. I had, I had a, a church, a pastor, first pastor, who told us, God can't hear the prayer of a sinner. Really? then how can I say a sinner's prayer if you can't hear me? How can I ask God to forgive me if I'm a sinner? You don't think God hears the prayer of a sinner? God hears the prayer of the heart. I'm wrong. I need you. I love you. I can't take it anymore. God, show yourself to me. And He does. He says He's looking for people whose hearts are loyal to Him. You really want to know who God is? You think God's up there messing with dudes? I've not watched this. Oh, 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 sorry, dude. God desires that relationship. That's how He created us. That's what He wants from us. Those who really want to know the Lord, there are promises for those who pursue that and who do. Let me read a few scriptures to you. James 4 8. Draw near to God. And He will draw near to you. That means as I make movement towards God, He makes movement towards me. That alone is a beautiful promise right there. Even when I blow it, like the prodigal son, it's the only picture in the Bible, it's the only illustration in the Word of God where you see God running is when a sinful son or daughter is returning home and he runs out to embrace and bless. Jesus said this in Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If life has wearied us, if we're burned out, if we're tired, we can't take it anymore, and we come. God, Jesus, I need you. He will give us rest for our souls. Eternal rest. Proverbs 8, 17. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligent will find me. It's not a game of hide and seek. God's not hiding, man. If you want to find God, you'll find Him. 
Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. Rest for your soul, enduring riches, eternal life, eternal salvation are found in the Lord. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to believe uh, to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. If you have a heart and a faith, hey look, I don't, I don't know what's going on in life. I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. But I know there's a God. And I know He's out there. And Lord, I'm coming to You. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He's not hiding. He's not playing games. He's not trying to make it tough. He's trying to do everything He can for us to have a relationship with Him. He loves us. He will reveal Himself to us. Now, why do people reject this? Why? It's interesting. Why do they reject God and His gift of salvation through Jesus? What blocks men, mankind, Jesus tells Nicodemus right here. He says, this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Because men, mankind, love their sinful pleasures more than they love God. Matter of fact, sometimes when people are in a desperate place and sin and, and we're always helping them and bailing them out, we're hurting them. Because sometimes you've got to get to a place where it's so down that the only way to look is up. You know, people come to me because I'm the pastor and they'll say, oh, Pastor Tom, if you could just talk to and help my mother, brother, sister, husband, son, nephew, niece, if you could just come and talk to them, I know that, that, that they would listen to you and I know that, that, that they would change. And, and I do. I go, I talk to them, I try, I give them scripture, I give them testimony of Jesus Christ, I give them the word of God, and they don't change, and then I get blamed. <laughs> you didn't spend enough time with them. You didn't reach out enough, Pastor Tom. You didn't do this. And you know what? It's not the truth. I can tell you right now, when I sit down with the person long enough, I already know where we're going. But here's what I tell them all, the same thing. When they hate their sin more than they love their sin, they'll change. But until they love their sin more than Jesus, they're not going to change. There's nothing I can say to them. And I know people get disappointed and let down. Oh, well, Pastor Tom, if you just keep calling. You know, I can call a thousand times. And I'm praying. And I'm willing to share and talk to them. But until they hate their sin more than they love it, until they hate the darkness, they're never going to change. And Jesus said this. They love darkness more than they love light. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He was the light of men. Light came into the world and darkness comprehended it not. Darkness couldn't understand it. Men don't like the light. We don't like it when we're in sin. We don't like the light. That's why people reject it. We spend a good part of our, our teenage years trying to blow out all the lights in the neighborhood. Why? Because we didn't want anybody to see what we're doing. We love the darkness. I remember we liked roaches. We'd be on the side of some school drinking and smoking and all this. The police would come up the spot like, poo! Ah! We'd all scatter like roaches. Not because we were doing Bible study, amen? But because we were sitting, we were in darkness. So whether it's a physical light, why do you think you go to bars and the lights are all low? It's dark. I can move around. I can sniff around. I going to see what I'm doing. How much money do you think bars would make if they were lit up like Walmart? <laughs> Unless it's at a beach or something. <laughs> Jesus brings forth the light and exposes our darkness. See, I'm either ready, like, yeah, well, I'm a wretch, yeah, yes. I am. I, I just, I do these things. I hate what I do. I just need you. I'm either ready for that or I'm not. And that's why people reject it. It's nothing personal. 
not the personal on you would bring the gospel. You may become the enemy because you may be representing the light. They may not want to be around you because when they're around you, they start feeling guilty because you were doing what they did and now you no longer do it. It's like, ah, yeah, yeah, whatever. And you're going to take the hit for that. But this is why there was a rejection of them. Now there was a man and he was drawn by God, Nicodemus. He was one of the rulers of Israel. He was part of the, the Sanhedrin, that, that ruling religious governing body, the, the, the religion that was lorded over Israel. He was one of those guys, and he was taking note. He was watching what Jesus was doing. And he was fascinated. Hey, nobody can do the things that you were doing unless you're sent by God. I know you're from God. He comes at night because the rest of them were rejecting Jesus. Vehemently. They hated Jesus. Why? Because they were dark. They had power and they did not want to give that power up. Jesus was blowing the doors off religion and the hierarchy and all the rituals and all the trips. He was bringing it down eye level and making it a personal relationship with God about an individual. And the things he was doing, they didn't like. So, so Nicodemus has to come at night because he doesn't want to get persecuted by these guys initially. He wants to come down and find out for himself what this guy's all about. He has a heart to know Jesus for himself. And he comes. And it says this, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Interesting. What's interesting is the response Jesus gives to his question. He wants to know Jesus for himself, but Jesus kind of gets right to the point. Jesus doesn't really beat around the bush with things. He gets to the heart of the matter. He knows why Nicodemus is actually really there. Nicodemus is seeing something with Jesus. He's seeing something that he's never seen before. And, and he knows he's from God. And he knows Jesus is the answer to his questions. And he, you know, hey, we know you're from God. Jesus gets right to the point. He cuts right to the quick, almost as saying, I know why you're here. I know that you want to know about eternal life and your personal salvation. I know. So I'm going to give you the answer before we even get into other things. Let me cut to the quick. He says this. Most assuredly, and he says that three times, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I don't mean see like, oh, there it is over there. I mean enter in and see it. Be part of it. Cannot unless he's born again. Right to the point. Nicodemus doesn't argue with him. No, no, no. I'm not, I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about this. No. Because that's why Nicodemus is there. You see everybody out in the world. They want to know. They want to know what is the way. What's the way I'm supposed to go? What's the truth? What's the meaning of life? We all want to know. We search and wrap our brains. At the end of the day, people want to know what happens when we die. People want to know what the next step is. We're going to read that later on. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Pastor Tom's 10 great tests. If you pass them, you can get into heaven. No, except through me. So Jesus cuts to the quick. This is heavy for Nicodemus to wrap his mind around this whole thing. Initially, he asked the obvious question that we probably would have all asked being in Nicodemus' shoes at that time. Now, we're all familiar with it because we've heard it a thousand times. You must be born again. You must be born again. But Nicodemus, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus responds again to him and he says, one more time, most assuredly. It's interesting that he uses this three times. The Greek word for most Surely. Your Bible may say, verily, verily, truly, truly, depending on the version, most assuredly, but, but really the same word is used twice. So truly, truly, verily, verily would be, would be true. Most assuredly means most definitely. But the Greek word is amen. Amen. 
That's what the word is that he used. He says, Amen, Amen, Amen. And when Amen is used in the beginning of a sentence, it's different from how it's used at the end of a sentence. In the beginning of a sentence, Amen means this is true. It's a truth. Here's what it says. It's truly of the truth. It's a fact. At the end of a statement means so it is, so it should be. Let it be affirmed. But he starts by declaring this truth. That listen to me. Really, I'm going to give you a truth. It's true of what I say next. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. He's emphasizing. He's giving us and Nicodemus a life fact. Like gravity. You cannot throw this ball up in the air and expect it not to come down unless God holds on to it. It's going to come down. Here's a life fact. It's called gravity. Here's a spiritual fact. It's called salvation. We cannot get into the kingdom of God unless we are born again. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus is still trying to grasp hold of this. He says, how can these things be? How can this be? Well, the short answer is, it can be because it's from God and not from men. It's something that is birthed of God and not from men. That's how it can be. With men... It is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Why? Because He's God. How can it be? It can be a spiritual birth by God. These are things done by God, not man, not religion, not religion, rituals, but born of God. Like the wind, we don't see it, nor do we know where it comes from, yet we feel it, we see its effects. You cannot say the wind is not real because it's there. We just don't know where it comes from and how it comes about. But the wind is real. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. Unlike a physical birth, a spiritual birth in a person's life is something that you cannot see take place physically. Now you can see the effects that it's having on the person, and the person who's having it can feel the effects of what's going on in their life, the experience, but it's a spiritual origin in nature. It's something like the wind that comes upon you, and thus it's a spiritual birth. Jesus says this, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Jesus is clearly speaking about a physical birth and a spiritual birth that we all must have. When you're born, when you're created at inception, you are put into an amniotic sac and you grow and you grow. You're in this water. And when the water breaks, the women say, my water broke. When the water breaks, the baby comes. The baby is brought forth by water. It's a physical birth. We all have seen it. We all have understood it. A physical birth is brought by, about by water. But there has to be a time in our life after a physical birth that you have a spiritual birth. I don't care what you call it. You can call it a spiritual awakening, born anew, born afresh. But there has to come a time in your life where spiritually there's a new birth in your life. You have to come to this revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He died for your sins, that He rose from the dead on the third day and went back into the kingdom to everlasting life. That you and I cannot atone for our sins. That you and I cannot make things right with God, no matter what we do, because we are imperfect. But that God did it through His great love, by stepping off the throne, becoming a man, living as we did. Sinless though, taking those sins upon Himself, taking your sins and my sins and my punishment on Him and dying for it, and thus releasing me from my sin. You have to come to a point in your life where you acknowledge that, where you understand that. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is not an intellectual understanding. 
Because there's a lot of people who intellectually know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And 15 inches to the heart is going to keep them out of the kingdom. Because it goes from intellectualism to the heart, which is a life change. I know I shouldn't be eating bacon wrapped jalapenos filled with cream cheese, amen? The whole box of Captain Crunch when nobody's home. The hogging dogs. I know I should not be eating those things. Intellectually, I am on it. Sausage, pepperoni, double cheese pizza, I'm on it. Intellectually, I know that. But until you see a much thinner man, it has not come into my heart and become a lifestyle change. Amen? And therein lies the difference. When the doctor tells you, if you have another piece of pepperoni, you're going to die. <laughs> okay, i got to stop. Then it becomes, oh, life, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know. And that happens with us physically. The doctor says, don't smoke, don't drink, don't do this, don't do it anymore. You're going to die. you got diabetes, you got this, you got that. Okay, then what? We change our life. Well, how come you don't eat pizza anymore? Well, how come you're not having these cream-filled donuts? How come you don't do this anymore? Well, I can't because I'm going to die. How come you're not looking at porn anymore? How come you're not doing shots with us anymore? How come you're not smoking dope with us anymore? How come you're not gossip? How come you don't do these things anymore? Because I love the Lord. And He died for those sins. And I'm not going to do that. Because the wages of sin is death. I don't do that anymore. See, that's from here to here. Intellectual to life, to love, to heart. So it's not an intellectual decision. It starts as an intellectual thought. Wow, he, he did die for my sins. Wow, I am a sinner. I can't do this. He has to do for me. And then it comes to a life change. But there has to be this time in our life where we do that. Where we're born again. We start a new life in Christ that incorporates God in our life every day. And Jesus in our life. And what do you want, Lord? I used to wake up every morning with a wife. Oh, what am I going to do today? Where's the party at? What are we going to drink? What are we going to do? What's going on? I, I had my agenda. But you see, then all of a sudden it's like, well, what is your agenda, God? What would you like me to do today? It's a life change. It's a new life. I get it. The old life is done. I'm going to start living a new life and people see it. How come you don't do that? Well, I'm born again. I started a new life. When you awaken to this and realize the truth and receive it, you will be saved. And Jesus questions Nicodemus in his position. How, you know, Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus is kind of giving him a response of how can these things be? You're asking me how these things can be? How is it that you are a teacher of the law and you don't know these things? You're supposed to be the spiritual head of the nation. You don't know these things? Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify to what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things, you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but you came down from heaven. Uh, came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, the Messiah of Jesus, who is in heaven. I'm telling you about basic earthly things that a person's life needs to be changed. You need to have a new birth here physically, you need to have a new birth, excuse me, spiritually on earth. And you can't get a hold of this. If I tell you about what's going on in heaven, what heaven's going to be like, you'll never get to understand it. So Jesus is going to relay to Nicodemus this spiritual birth, this example in such a way that he, as a teacher of Israel, would understand it. And Jesus says this, as Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must, uh, must be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if you read that and you don't know about the serpent on the bronze pole, you need to read your Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Numbers chapter 21. God had done all these wonderful things for the nation of Israel. He took them out of Israel and Egypt. He did all these miracles. He provided for them. He showed himself strong. And as they did again and again and again, this is why they died in the wilderness. They grumbled and complained against Moses and God. 
Why do you want us here? This bread is terrible. It sucks. We don't like this anymore. We're tired. And God said, you know what? I'm tired of you. And I'm tired of you complaining. And this time I'm going to judge you now. So he sent fiery serpents out into the camp of Israel. And these guys were getting bit by these snakes. And they were dying. Then they began to panic because they were dying because snakes were in the camp and they were getting bit and they were dying because they were grumbling against God. And they ran to Moses, Moses, help us, help us. We're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. It says this in Numbers 21, 7. They said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents, takes away the sin from us. So God tells Moses, hey man, take a bronze metal, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole. Bronze is always speaks of judgment. Put it on a pole. Put that pole up in the air. Whoever gets bit and looks to the pole will be healed. Why? Well, because everybody knows the snake is the magic healing pole. No. It could have been a, a bronze lemon. What healed them was obedience to the Lord. What healed them was obedience to God. Hey, here's what I'm asking you to do. How is me looking at a pole going to heal me from a snake bite? It's not, unless you have the faith to believe that God said that, and by faith you look to that snake, that bronze serpent, by faith it'll be healed. And you'll never know unless you do it. Because if you don't have the faith, guess what? If you won't look to it for healing, you're not going to be healed. Well, they all look to it, and it stopped. Jesus is healing the Nicodemus. And you know the same way in Israel? When Moses had to lift that up, and the people had to look to that for healing, I'm going to be lifted up. And everyone's going to have to look to me at the cross, at what was done at the cross, by faith for healing in their life, for correction in their life. No doubt. Sometime later, when Nicodemus saw Jesus up on the cross, his words were in home to No doubt, because we see Nicodemus as a changed man. In Romans 3.23, we are told, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So as a sinner, my wages, no matter what, if you don't think you're a sinner, come see me. I'll explain it to you. If you think you're pretty good at upholding the laws of God, Jesus had a check out for you. And he said, if you even think it, you did it. Which pretty much eliminates everybody. Except for the one guy I met. You guys remember that? This guy from theperfectchurch.com. You remember the story? I'm in a jacuzzi. And I'm hanging out. And I'm like chilling. And this guy comes in. He's like, hey, what's up? I'm like, hey, what's up? And he's like, what's your name, Tom? What's your name, Tom? Yeah, what do you do? You know, where are you from? I'm here. You know, what are you doing? And, so, uh, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a pastor. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor too. I'm like, cool. He's like, what's the name of your church? I'm like, what's the name of I said, what's the name of your church? He said, perfectchurch.com. I said, that's a pretty interesting name for a church, don't you think? No, man. We're perfect. I said, I, you know, we're sinners. Saved by grace. No, we're not. I said, you know, no, we're all sinners. No, we, we are made perfect in Christ. I said, so you don't sin? No, I don't. I said, yes, you do. He said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do, bro. He said, no, I don't. I said, so if the Hawaiian Tropic uh, bikini volleyball team was here, that's right, you have no impure thoughts or nothing. No. I said, why? I said, so you don't sin? He goes, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. He said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. I do not sin. I said, you're mad. That's it. I'm not mad. <laughs> For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All, everyone. Wages of sin is death. That's what we can expect. But the gift of God, the gift is something that you don't earn. The gift of God is eternal salvation. If you earned it, it would be the wages. See, the wages of sin, the payout of sin, what you earn is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I didn't work for you. He just gives it to me. That's great. How do I receive it? By faith. I walk into your house. I slap down a pair of keys for a brand new 
and I say, sure. And I'm like, right, yeah. There it is. Here's the keys, here's the title, it's yours. Why? Because I, I love you. Yeah, right, okay. I'd be afraid to get in the car because I'd be afraid to get arrested down the block as soon as I got done, I'd just get on the car. I come back a week later, it's still there. I come back a year later, the tires are flat. I come back five years later, it's rusted and sitting there because you've never received it. I come back 20 years later, it's a pile of rusted heat in the yard. You've never received it, you've never taken it. It doesn't change the fact that it's yours. It's yours. Only if you believe what I say, you reap the benefit of it. Because it's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Now, all who would look to the cross, all those who would look to Jesus, have faith in what God said and believe that He was the one who covered their sins, that He died for their sins. They would not die, but have everlasting life. They would enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus continues and tells him why and how this would be. For God so loved the world. Not men, not religion, not churches. For God, it's an act of love. It's an act of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever, blanket, whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world that the world should be condemned through Him, but that through Him the world might be saved. That was called that. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Through God's great love for us, he steps off the throne, he takes that form, he takes our punishment, we have this relationship with him, he did not come to destroy us, but to save us. And, Jesus continues, he who believes in him is not condemned. That means there are no charges brought against you in the kingdom of God. There's accusations from the enemy, but there are no charges brought against you in the kingdom of God. Why? He took those. <clears throat> but, he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name, Jesus, of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Now he's going to pronounce the condemnation. You commit murder, you stand before the judge, and the judge pronounces judgment on you, condemnation on you. You have been charged with murder, and you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree, and the sentence is death. That's the charge. That's the condemnation against you in the court of law. But in the court of heaven, this is the condemnation right here. That the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. You loved your sin more than you loved God's way. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes into the light, that his deeds might be seen clearly, that they have been done in God. Their deeds, their actions of faith, their life that has been changed, not perfect, but forgiven, clearly reflects this new life that was born clearly reflects their love for God and their, their acceptance of this gift of salvation. We call it fruit. Clearly, you can see that this person loved Jesus. No, they're not perfect. Yeah, they yelled at me. Yeah, they did this. Yeah, they, they still messing up. Yeah, they're still tripping on themselves. But, they say they're sorry. But, they right their wrong. But, they go before God. But, they're still coming and trying and doing their best before God. And only He is the judge. Amen? If I was the judge, we're all in trouble, amen? His judgment is perfect. They're going to be seen for what they are. Jesus said he will know them by their fruit. And their fruit will be displayed that they did love me. They did try. They did serve me. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No one can bring a charge. It's so easy because it's done for us. Again, in Romans 10, 8, you should know this by heart. I quote this all the time. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You just heard it right here. So it applies to all of us. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe 
in your heart, not intellectually, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. Church has nothing to do with it, I'm sorry. You may do it at church. You may come to church and get strong and worship and do all these other things, but it's about here in your heart. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Already done. The work was done for you. Already done. Easy as pie. One, two, three. So simple. I can't believe it sometimes. Amen? I mean, it was a revelation to me when we got saved and I was sitting there thinking of all the nasty, bad things I did. And I'm like, how can you love me? How can you forgive me? I took those sins. Don't you understand, Tom? I took those sins. Before you were even born, I took those sins. Those sins are credited to me. I died so you don't have to. I got punished so you don't have to. It's my gift of love to you. Wow. Wow. That takes the whole burden off the whole church and Christianity thing because I don't have to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to, to tithe. I don't have to serve. I don't have to be nice. I don't have to do anything but believe. But I get to love. I get to forgive. I get to go to church and fellowship. I get to pray. I get to worship. I get to tithe my money. I get to tithe my time. I get to be a servant of God and do what He wants because I love Him. Because now I see He saved me. What a wonderful thing that is. How great is that? Simple. Takes all the burden off me. His yoke is light. His burden is easy. But religions... Burden is heavy, and the yoke is hard. I don't know if I can keep all these rules and rituals and regulations, but his burden is light, and his yoke is easy. Hey, Tom, I just want you to love people. I want you to have mercy and grace on people. I want you to prefer others in love. I want you to put them first instead of yourself. I just want to sit and have time with you. I want you to know me through my word. I just want you to spend that time. And then I want to use you as a vessel to go love other people and forgive other people and tell other people about this gift that I have. Okay. It's a lifestyle change. There has to come a time in our life there's no prerequisite for this. There is no prerequisite. There has to be a time in our life when we receive this. And we say, yeah, this is true. You are Lord. You did die for my sin. It's a wonderful gift, and I received this. And, and today is the day, and I start anew. March 21st, 1987, Lisa and I. That was the day. March 21st, 1987. That's our second birthday. It's funny because it falls between our two real birthdays. March 14th and March 27th. That was the day. It was a new life where things changed. Definitely haven't been perfect. At least Elisa hasn't. Amen? <laughs> it hasn't been perfect since then. We've made some mistakes. We've blown it. We've done things. But guess what? Take care. It doesn't give me an excuse to sin. It gives me an <clears throat> excuse not to sin. It gives me the power not to sin. I'm going to blow it. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfectchurch.com. But it gives me the strength to move forward. In Christ. When you sincerely believe this and receive this, you're born again. There's an old expression, I'm ending here. The old expression is this born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. Born once, physical birth. Water breaks, I come out, I live my life, I'm going to die a physical death. Then, I'm going to stand before judgment. Charge is going to be read. I didn't believe in what God did. And I'm going to have a spiritual death. I'm going to have an eternal separation from God. It's called hell. Yeah, hell's a real place. It's nasty. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was not created for you. God desires that none should perish. No, not one. Jesus said this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him you would be saved from what? The condemnation. 
the separation, hell. Yet, if you're born twice, you're only going to die once. If you're born of the water and you're born again of the Spirit, you're only going to face a physical death. And here's how it's going to be. You're going to be on earth, you're going to breathe your last, you're going to go, and you're going to expire. Your next breath is going to be in the kingdom of God, with Jesus, eternal, forgiven, redeemed. That's what it's about. So I'll end with this. What about Nicodemus? What happened to him? Interesting guy. Came at night initially, a little bit worried. Maybe at this time he didn't quite get it, but in John chapter 7, when they're vehemently opposing and condemning Jesus, Nicodemus stands up and tries to defend him. He gets pummeled. Shut up, get out of here, what are you, one of them? He was kind of a meek guy. Then later on, we see him in John chapter 19, him and Joseph of Arimathea, another wealthy guy. If you were a ruler of the Jews, you were wealthy. They go to Pilate and say, we want the body of Jesus. We want to bury, bury him. Nicodemus provided 100 pounds of the ointment. Very, a lot of money. So everybody knew what they did, obviously. Now, from extra biblical writings, we hear that Nicodemus gave evidence in favor of Jesus when Pilate put him on trial. But again, shut down. Afterwards, after he made that stand, he was kicked out of his office as a ruler. He was banished from Jerusalem by these guys. And that he was baptized later on by John and Peter. His remains were found in the common grave, which means he lost all his money. And then we're told right out that he lost his wealth, his position, and his status because he confessed Jesus. But he gained a treasure in heaven and eternal life. Amen? Amen. The question today is, have you gained that? Have you made that decision? So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask the Lord that today, if you haven't made that decision, that you make it. We're due for a baptism, and maybe we should do one in a couple of weeks, maybe two weeks, go down to Kalapaki, have a little potluck, go down there and baptize. What baptism is, is it's a outward expression of an inward change. And as Jesus died and rose again, we say, I'm laying down the old man, the old woman, and I'm going to come up anew with Christ. Maybe we've drifted, maybe we've lost pace, maybe we haven't been in that spot, maybe we just renew, I want to renew my dedication. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll plan for two weeks. But I want to pray for you in closing today. It's a simple scripture. It's a simple method God laid forth for us. Don't make it complex and just receive the gift of salvation. So Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I'm not going to make anybody stand. I'm not going to make anybody raise their hand, Father. But Lord, when we do a baptism, Father, that will be a public profession of their faith that they've started a new life and made the Lord and Savior. If there's anybody in the room today who has not, has not been born again, Father, who has not yielded their life to you, who has not accepted the gift of salvation at the cross, that today would be their birthday, that they would be born afresh and born anew by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would forgive them of their sins, Father, that they would repent today for not believing, not serving, and that you would forgive them of their sins and come into their life and be their Lord and Savior forever. That they too would have eternal life with you, Lord. That today would be the day. Lord, if you so put it on their heart that you would have them come up and tell us, you give them a Bible and pray with them, Pastor Ben, Pastor Mike, Pastor Falcon. Lord, that they would come to a baptism, Lord, and just express their love for you publicly, Lord. That they would not be ashamed of the gospel. That they would bear much fruit. That you would bring them the peace that surpasses all understanding. So we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the great work you did that we didn't have to do it. And we just commit this 
day up to you, we commit this life up to you, we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name. Amen.